Good evening and welcome to Hard Fire. I'm Mark Axon of the New York State Libertarian Party. It's my pleasure to be your host tonight for another discussion of politics and contemporary events from a libertarian perspective. Tonight, my guest is Cameron Weber, an economist who had been with the State Department, Chief of Financial Oversight at the State Department, and currently a doctoral student in economics and history. Cameron, welcome to Hard Fire. Thank you, Mark. It's a pleasure to be here. Great. Cameron, tonight we're going to talk about the Federal Reserve System, which I understand uh, has some degree of involvement in the monetary policy of this country. Yes. And <clears throat> in particular, I'd like to know why the Federal Reserve is involved in, in the banking system. What, what is the role of the Federal Reserve? Okay. Um, the Federal Reserve was founded in 1914. Up until that point, there was a, a, a gold standard that ev evolved, that emerged over time since the medieval period. It was through common law, through common practice, that a gold standard evolved. And then it wasn't until uh, the central banking period, uh, w the United States Central Bank, the Fed, 1914, uh, that we've had such a, um, a federal, a central banking policy based on stability. Before you had gold, uh, a naturally evolved emergent gold standard, which uh, created a stable monetary policy throughout the world based on trade, but only under central banking uh, after the gold standard ended with the, the World War I have we had such an unstable uh, monetary policy based on uh, the fallacy of a central bank that thinks it can, can uh, stabilize monetary policy. But isn't it the role of the Fed to stabilize the, poli the uh, money supply so there is certainty for the uh, individuals who trade in dollars or euros or whatever they're trading in? Uh, that's <laughs> That's the irony, is that prior to the central banking, there, the monetary policy was much more stable. And it's because of the central bank that we have instability. They pump up the, they pump up the money supply, and that causes a bubble, and then they pop the bubble by contracting the, monetary, the money supply. And, and uh, economic cycles are natural because they bring growth and efficiency. It's only the Fed who exasperates these things. Well, you said they pump it up. Is that by printing more dollars <coughs> and creating more, inflation? Create, yes, printing more dollars and lowering the, lowering the interest rate. Well, you know, one, one person told me that the history of central banking is really the history of war and inflation. Exactly. That's exactly right, Mark. The, uh, that's that's fiat, fiat money. When you 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 remove any uh, species-backed money, so that you can inflate the money to fight a war. That's exactly what happened, and that's why the gold standard ended with World War One, when England, uh, who was the uh, the central bank for the world, all the all the, the gold uh, bills of exchange were traded on the London Exchange, and when England pulled out of the gold standard to um, to fight the wo World War One, that was the end of monetary stability. And the taxpayers won't pay more for wars, so you just have to print more That's money? Right. That's right. And then when you combine that with uh, Keynesian economics and, and the fallacy of printing more money to encourage growth, you end up with inflation and debt. Well, okay. And Keynesian economics is, is basically um, if I hire uh, somebody to dig ditches and somebody else to fill them in, then I've pretty much got 100% employment, and that's a good thing, right? Well, as long as you print money to pay each of them. Yeah, that's right. Okay, that, that would be good. All right, so let's go to more contemporary times. Yeah, yeah. So the Fed and central banking are involved in the bailouts, and, and of course we've had a tremendous amount of bailouts over the last few that's, years. That, that, that's right, and so I'm very glad to be able to talk about that now okay, so, uh, yeah, for, 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 for a libertarian audience who... And for the Tea Partiers, if there's any watching. Um, okay. Under the gold standard, the classical central banking was if a bank got into trouble, they could go to the central bank and pay high interest rates with good collateral for short periods of time for any liquidity problems. Today, 
under the, the recent bailouts, they give crappy collateral at near zero rate and zero rates of interest, and they've been holding the, the, the crappy collateral for a couple years now. And the so, crappy collateral or mortgage-backed securities mortgage, that mortgage, have been collateralized and nobody knows who really owns what or who mm, owes that's what? That's right. That, that, that's right. So what you have under the classical gold standard central banking, you had a clear rule of law with, 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 with rules. And what you have today under central banking, especially with in conjunction with the Treasury Department and their picking and choosing winners in conjunction with the central bank, which is supposed to be independent, you have a violation of the rule of law because it's arbitrary and it's not done through these classical central banking <coughs> uh, rules. All right, well, the argument, I think, that that a libertarian would make, of course, is that it's rewarding bad behavior. You're rewarding and, and right. helping those which companies or banks or That's car right. manufacturers or whatever who perhaps should fail and somebody else will come in and fill the void. That, that's exactly right. And that is why the banks still have all that, and the central bank holds all that, those crappy mortgage-backed assets, is because they weren't allowed to liquidate. The banks didn't want to take the loss because they knew that they would get bailed out. Okay, but don't, you know... Rewarding sooner bad behavior. Sooner or later, don't, doesn't the government have a, a, a legitimate role in protecting those institutions which are just simply too large to fail? Um, what would happen if Citibank went under or okay. Chase? I mean, all it, right. Let, let me just say about this: too large to fail. It's too large to succeed. And in fact, it's government policy which creates the large institutions in the first place Be, by, by limiting competition. I mean, the FDIC uh, forcibly closed more than 240 banks in the last year. Say, say that you and I are competing and I don't like your competition. I call Sheila Blair and I say, oh, uh, uh, Mark Bank, uh, I don't think they're really liquid. And then, you know, it depends how close I am. That's public choice theory economics. Then they close you down and, and that centralizes the banks and make, makes banks larger. And it, what is removing the, the competition. What's the Fed's role in all this? The, the Fed, the Fed, okay, the Fed is supposed to, in. The Fed is supposed to keep monetary stability. In the United States, they're supposed to do monetary stability and uh, increase the money supply for uh, controlling unemployment. All right. So, in order to do that, monetary policy relates to the banks. So, because the the banks hold as reserves United States government paper bonds. Okay, and so. The Fed has to work with the banks, so the, the so because because the Fed works with the banks, therefore they then have to regulate the banks. So they're deeply involved in what's going on at the banks. So we have private industry and the government sort of merged together. That's exactly which is, what it uh, is. a classic definition of monopoly. Yeah, monopoly I mean, capitalism, anti -comp anti competition, unintended consequences, and now recently in the last couple of years, the egregious bailouts. And these bailouts have have exacerbated the unemployment situation too, have they not? Uh, yes. Um, and how is that? Okay, we already we already discussed that. If 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 um, if someone makes a bad investment in a free market system. I'm a free market economist, mm -hmm. so what I do is I look at, okay, what went wrong and why? And usually what, went hap what happened, and so the reason something went wrong is because there was bad government incentives, okay? And so the bad government incentives uh, were that the Basel standards, international monetary standards, banking standards, allowed banks to hold government-backed paper, Fannie Mae, Freddie, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac paper, 100% guaranteed mortgage-backed mortgage, mortgage -backed bonds mm -hmm. backed by the United States government. They could hold those uh, w uh, against less reserves. So the less reserves they had, the more money they could lend out and the more profit they could make. So in fact, what caused the crisis was uh, systemic risk 
caused by government regulation. So you had this big encouragement of, of mortgage-backed bonds backed by 100% guarantee, government guarantees, and then an international banking system which encouraged leveraging up on those things. There so, also was, so, so that's, so. that's banking policy, and, yeah. that, and that's what caused the crisis. I don't know if it's just banking policy. I think it's government policy as well, because didn't the that's government right. also not only encourage, but to some degree twist the arms and say to the banks, we want you to make loans in this district or That's that right. district or some other place. The Community and then, Reinvestment Act, which and it, was stepped up under Bush too, and that's, boom, that triggered the bubble also. F the FHA in 1998 had a, uh, a uh, they wanted 50% of their loans to be 0% down loans. All right, so if somebody has no money down and they are they are highly leveraged, then you've got a situation where if they miss a few payments, now their debt is here. Meanwhile, the value of their apartment could go down right. or the house could go down. Now they're leveraged for 120 or 130 percent of the value of their home. Right. These are the people who walk away. Who ends okay. up picking up the uh, the loss? Well, of course, the taxpayer does, but but and the renters, people who don't own homes and didn't take on risk that they they, they couldn't manage, but have but, to pay taxes but, nevertheless. But have to pay. The, yeah, to bail it out. And, and a devaluing dollar uh, as the Fed prints more money. But I want to go back to that issue of, Amer of home ownership. Home ownership in the United States was overtly encouraged in the 1930s to prevent people from being, becoming involved in radical politics. If you own a home, if you have a mortgage, then you work nine to five to pay off that debt. You don't get involved in radical politics. And that's been the United States policy ever since. Once the government program is put in place, it doesn't go away. So the mentality of the United States government, Democrats and Republicans, all the way through since the 1930s, is to encourage Americans to buy homes that they can't afford. And of course, the tax code uh, encourages that's that by making the interest on it on a loan tax deductible. But the rent that you pay for a house or an apartment is not tax deductible. Uh, thank you, Mark. You just touched on the most fundamental problem with the United States economy, and that is, yes, you can write off debt on the tax code, both mortgage debt and corporate, corporate debt, but equity is taxed twice. That's how come you can get a management class that creates debt, trading these mortgage-backed securities for fees, each firm counterparty gets a fee. The debt spiral goes up because they write it off on taxes. Yet the owners of the companies, the equity holders, are such a small percentage that they don't have an incentive to monitor what's going on. You know, Cameron, we've been talking a lot about mortgages. And I used to think that a bank would make money by lending it to people, charging interest, uh, taking back an interest in their home called a mortgage. And, and now it seems it's a lot easier for the banks just to take TARP money and, and buy wow. uh, treasuries with it or something. That, well, exactly. That, <laughs> it's, it's unbelievable. They're, no, out, it's not they're not in the lending business. They're in the, uh, in the government, crime. they're in the receiving of bailout money, of taxpayer bailout it's a, money. Uh, it, it's, uh, it's, a it's, it's, a it's not a crime because they're doing it. Maybe it will, history will look at it as a crime. Should but, be a crime. But, uh, what's happened is, unlike the classical lender of last resort, central bank, theory where you charge high amounts of interest for, for good collateral for short periods of time. Like I said, it's zero percent interest. So the banks give them that mortgage-backed crap they, and then they can borrow money at zero percent. So you buy a bond. You buy a corporate bond, you buy U.S. government bonds, and you make the, the, the interest percentage. That's called the carry trade. So you make all these profits mm. without investing in anything that's productive. All the mafia doing, would say all you're, you're playing doing, for the VIG. <laughs> all, all you're doing is investing in more debt. And so, so, so you have people, people are stuck with homes they can't afford, therefore have to get jobs that they don't like instead of working for themselves. In, in, Amer in um, American culture is an entrepreneurial culture and because of this huge amount of debt encouragement and the banks who aren't lending to entrepreneurs because they're getting zero percent money from the Fed, 
the American entrepreneurial culture is just is shot. Uh, but it's not a bad thing to own a home. I mean, that in of itself is not a bad. Most most Americans do own homes. Yeah, six, and, sixty percent. That's right. And 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 home ownership per se is not the problem. I think the problem is that the government and the and the banking industry, to some degree, hand in hand, have encouraged people to take on much more debt than they can possibly, uh, right. you know, uh, afford. And then you've got a bankruptcy code that says it's okay, just, you know, walk in the door and we'll let you, you know, and well, we'll we write off some of it. Yeah, yeah, we, we, right. And I know that that's been reined in to some degree over the last decade, but there still is an ongoing uh, incentive all the time to people to borrow much more than they can afford That's and right. not to be responsible for their own actions, which of course from a libertarian point of view is something that we yeah. would never encourage. Libertarians believe that you're free to do what you want, but similarly you're responsible and you have to pay the piper. If you did something, you caused something, that's your responsibility to remedy the situation. That, that's right. The tax code is, uh, the, is a, the tax code is a special interest to the financial sector, to the mortgage bankers, and to the real estate agents. It's a, it's a special interest to them. And, and what that does, it, it turns, I like to say that it turns people into tax-paying wage slaves. Instead of individuals who are responsible for their own innovative entrepreneurial activity and creativity, they get a nine to five job so they can pay off the mortgage that the government has encouraged. Sure, owning a home is good, Right when you're young, when you, after you've worked and you can afford it, but encouraging people to buy homes before they can afford it is is just but not good policy. But you don't have policy. to put any money down, and you you know, and we'll give you a ninety five percent or a hundred and five percent mortgage, and we'll finance and that's, your and that, and that's, uh, your closing costs. And yeah. don't worry, because Fannie and Freddie are there to take care of the problems. Th that's right. So so that's what caused the housing bubble. Yeah. And so. Then you have, so housing prices should go down. Mm -hmm. they, should, well, they, they, they need to liquidate and go down, but we have the mindset that we need to keep the housing prices up. Well, you're, a, it, you're an which, economist, and economists know that things go up and down and up and down. But they're not able to go down now is the problem, and that's free market economists. Libertarian economists, first of all, don't like the violation of the rule of law. And, right. and that, of course, is something that that's is a done the libertarian all the time. philosophy. Is first of all, you know, first of is the, the violation of the rule of law, special bailouts, special uh, um, incentives to to not live up to your mortgage obligations to so one the, class of people, but not to a different class of people. So you start picking and choosing and, who and gets and the special th favors. That's yeah, and that's a violation of the rule of law. And it's always upward redistribution. So it's the poor who didn't and the responsible who didn't take on more debt who are paying f for those th that that did and so that's redistribution upwards which is a which is an injustice that libertarians see so what can government be policy what can be done about central banking okay thank you for asking so uh, i would like to frederick hayek who won the nobel prize in 1975 in 1974 hayek won a nobel prize and uh, for his theory of the business cycle, which I described about central banks pumping up money and then dropping money and exasperating the cycle. So he won the, the Nobel Prize for that. But Europe was negotiating and discussing a, a common uh, EU, the Euro policy. Mm -hmm. And Hayek said <clears throat> why that would not work, okay? Because it removes fiscal accountability, fiscal and monetary accountability from the member states. So I'd like to... What Hayek did, Hayek studied monetary economics for 50 years. And he first he thought the gold standard would work, then he thought central banking would work. Finally, what he said is we need to denationalize the money and allow competition against the dollar. So when he says denationalize, he's not saying that we should have money countries get together like in Europe with the euro. What he's saying is the opposite. We should have competing monetary systems even within one country, like within the United States. That's right. Right now, if you, try to, if you call your money legal tender, the Treasury Department will throw you in jail. Oh, so, absolutely. So what he wants to do is, is allow free market money to compete against government money to keep government money honest. And so if you have competition, then you have an incentive to offer a decent product. He, he, 
and then the, a lot of economists, or even free market economists, not necessarily libertarian economists, but free market economists, um, are afraid of what would happen if you denationalize the money. But free market economists understand that a society is freely associating, and you can't plan the future. If you let people freely associate and, volu and contract voluntarily, properties will emerge. So competing banking systems will emerge. Competing uh, financial intermediaries w will emerge. But then we don't have stability because we don't know that the dollar will be accepted or the, well, the, or the yen or the yuan or whatever will be accepted in, in, in Arizona, but it won't be accepted in Utah or accepted in New Mexico, but not in Connecticut. So people, We don't have stability now. <laughs> not only do we not have stability now, we have exasperated cycles and we have a violation of the rule of law. Mm -hmm. So, all right, so what would Hayek's uh, well, well, solution so be? Uh, denationalize, and, but why should we not let people choose freely what money they want to use? By people, I mean the individuals who ought to have the right to decide whether they want to buy or sell for francs, pounds, dollars, demarks, or ounces of gold. I have no objection to government issuing money, but I believe their claim to a monopoly or their power to limit the kinds of money in which contracts may be concluded within their territory or to determine the rates at which monies can be exchanged to be wholly harmful. Okay, well, you know, Hayek is writing about what would be happen in a perfect world, but that's not going to happen today. So what about the current proposals for financial reform? Are, are any of them helpful? None of the current proposals address any of the problems in the, what happened. We're not addressing the prioritization of debt over equity, are we? No, that's not being addressed. We're not addressing the 100% Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac guarantees of mortgages with unlimited amounts. No, we're not. We haven't addressed that. We have not addressed... Um, so. Th those those are what caused the crisis. Well, and, and, and those this, are not being addressed. And this consumer uh, mentality, and there's nothing wrong with with consuming with consumption, no, no. but the consumer mentality that I want it so I should have it, but I don't have to pay for it, which is an anti-libertarian uh, yeah. philosophy. Which is let let somebody else take care of my problem that I created. Well, well people are savings now. Are saving now. We we had a negative. We had a very small savings rate during the housing boom but now after the semi crash people are saving again which oh. is you know which shows the resilience of people mm -hmm. who aren't who aren't dumb and don't need to have their lives controlled for them well, that's because true. they're they're saving now because their housing values went down right. how so about the, the government how's the government doing in oh, saving 13 trillion in debt and, and, <laughs> Unbelievable. And, and what what's really shameful now is these swap lines that the fed has promised the European Central Bank. So the Fed is kind of acting as an employer of, or as a, uh, as a, a, a uh, central bank for Europe. We're, we're allowing the dollarization of, uh, so in other words, just like the Fed is giving 0% to American financial institutions, we're giving discounting, we're promising discounting, discounted money to the, to the Euro Union. So that will help to bail out Greece or, or, yeah. or uh, Portugal Implicit, yeah. or whatever it's countries have power grab. It's a power grab. It's a power grab on the, on the behalf of the arrogant central bankers. And, and, and so, you know, the, the, the collusion. And the other thing is, the, uh, one of the proposals is to create a consumer protection agency within the Fed, okay? And so the problem was... To protect the consumers from the Fed or the other way yeah, around? Yeah, to, right. Because, the, okay, so the, the, the bubble and the problem was caused by the mortgages. Yet... As you know, as a real estate attorney, every mortgage that you sign has the FHA signal. It's a little, mm -hmm. little FHA. They, they, it's been approved. It's Fannie it's, yeah. or, or the FHA. Yeah, Somebody's so, behind so that. As so as the consumers going through their mortgage documents, right. they see the U.S. government stamp on there already. So what's... Why does that help? Why just a different government stamp? Why would that doesn't address the problem? It's paper overing the problems, which is excessive debt due to write off and not enough equity because of double taxation. Mm. All right, the, the other thing liquidation fund. All right, it's supposed to not cost the consumer anything. The idea is that. 
the Fed or a s Financial Stability Board would decide which financial institutions are bankrupt and then work out the, uh, just like the FDIC does with banks, work out the bankruptcy of it. So that removes it from the court system, from the civil system and civil bankruptcy and removes it to the administration who then would manage the, the liquidation of private businesses. Again, a, an egregious rule of law violation that had nothing to do with the, ba with nothing to do with the financial crisis. And of course, this is, this is what our current government is giving us. Cameron, we yeah. only have a minute or two left, yeah. so I have at least two solutions to propose to our viewers, and then I'll ask you again. Uh, the first one is that one of the things our viewers might be interested in doing is picking up this book here, written by our speaker tonight, Cameron Weber. It's Economics for Everyone and I strongly recommend this, and that would be a good investment of, of the few dollars that you have left. The other thing that our viewers might consider doing is voting for the libertarian candidates in their community, whether it is uh, a candidate for governor, a candidate for senator, such as what we have here in New York, or any place else is supporting the Libertarian Party. In New York, the New York State Libertarian Party maintains its website at www.ny.lp.org. And here in the city, the active uh, chapters in Brooklyn, Queens, Manhattan, and now Staten Island, and soon the Bronx. And that would include, uh, for example, the Manhattan chapter at www.manhattanlp.org. And there you can get more information about uh, uh, the activities in the city, our newspaper surf city, and this fine television show. And again, that's www.manhattanlp.org. And uh, there's also organizations here in Kings County, in Queens County, in Staten Island, and throughout the uh, state as well. So Cameron, uh, what, very briefly, because we only have a short amount of time left, uh, what, what solution would you propose for us to, to uh, should we do away with the Fed? What should we do? Uh, I agree with you that people should start looking into libertarianism, libertarian politics, and libertarian candidates for public office. And I think that we should do what Hayek says and allow competition against central banking and just make it legal to compete. That's and, what I would and do. And compete not just uh, uh, capitalists with each other, but compete within, within a system of, of different tenders and different government systems even. That's right. Allow competition against the dollar and see what evolves. The people in uh, the central bankers and the technocrats have been given way too much power, and the treasury officials have been given way too much power. Okay, well, thank you, Cameron Weber, and thank you, viewers, for being with us, and we'll see you again next time here at Hardfire. Thank you again. <laughs>